most people know very little about this period of time, so we looked into it. By the early 1400s, Europeans were ready to venture beyond their borders. The spirit of adventure and curiosity prompted Europeans to explore the world around them. The first three segments of our show will explain how these explorations began a long process that would bring together the people of many different lands and permanently change the world. In this segment, you will learn about God, glory, and gold. You will also hear from two men that contributed to European exploration. Excuse me, we're about to be work. Right, of course. What was your main purpose in exploration? To serve God, glory, and his majesty, to give light to those who remain in darkness, and to grow rich as all men desire to do. What were you considered? An early Portuguese explorer who wanted to strike the shame of I understand Portugal is a very successful country. Yeah, it was. The first European country to establish trading outposts on the west coast of Africa. Thank you for your time. Now we have with us the most enthusiastic supporter of exploration, <laughs> Prince Henry. Hello. So Henry, when did your dreams of, of overseas exploration first begin? In 1415 when I helped conquer the Muslim city of Santa, North Africa. And what did you encounter while there? We found exotic stores filled with pepper, cinnamon, cloves, and other spices. Also, large supplies of gold, silver, and jewels. And I understand you're a devout Christian? Yes, I was consumed by the quest to find new lands and spread Christianity. Did you ever use your wealth and power as a prince for voyages? Yes, in fact, I used my own fortune to organize more than 14 voyages along the western coast of Africa. What was accomplished by this? By the time I died in 1460, the Portuguese had established a series of trading posts along western Africa's shores. And is there anything else we should know about your health of exploration? Well, in 1419, I founded a navigation school on the southwestern coast of Portugal. Map maker, instruments, makers, ship builders, scientists, and sea captains gathered there to perfect their trade. Thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. The average carvel was 65 feet long, this versatile ship had triangular sails for maneuverability and square sails for power. The large cargo area could hold the numerous supplies needed for voyages. Its shallow draft allowed it to explore close to shore. Portuguese were establishing trading posts along the west coast of Africa. Spain watched with increasing envy. Christopher Columbus convinced Spain to finance a bold plan, finding a route to Asia by sailing west all across the Atlantic Ocean. The rival between Spain and Portuguese grew more intense. In 1494, Spain and Portugal signed the Treaty of Torresillas, in which they agreed to honor the line, the era, <laughs> the, sorry, the era of exploration and colonialization was about to begin in earnest. The English and Dutch began to challenge Portugal's dominance over the Indian Ocean trade. Pressure from the Dutch and English fleets took Portuguese control out of the Asian region. Then the Dutch and the English battled one another for control of the area. Both countries formed an East India, India Company. They had the power to mint money, make treaties, and raise their own armies. The Dutch East Indian Company was richer and more powerful than England's company. Hello, today on the show with us we have Captain Bunyan and Sailor Guy. Hi. Uh, so Captain, my question for you is what types of food did you bring on the string of the trip? Well, with 190 sailors, we had salt beef, salt pork, salt cod, a few peacocks, brad biscuits, white biscuits, oatmeal, dried peas, mustard seed, salt, flour, butter, vinegar, water, and beer. I know there's not a lot of healthy food today. Yes, some of the crew members suffered from scurvy. I'm just glad I wasn't one of them. But we didn't have a choice because the only food that didn't go bad. <laughs> Does this affect your health? <laughs> the failure to sustain more food groups caused a great deal of illnesses and sometimes even deaths. Alright, well there you have it. We will now talk about how China limits European contacts. The European voyages of exploration had led to opportunities for trade. China had become the dominant power in Asia under the Ming Dynasty. China's power vassal states from Korea to Southeast Asia. A peasant son, Hung Wu, commanded the rebel army that drove the Mongols out of China in 1368. Hung Wu's agricultural reforms 
increased rice production and improved irrigation. His son, Young Guo, continued his father's policies when Hung Wu died. Zhang Shi became emperor in 1661 and ruled for some 60 years. He reduced government expenses and lowered taxes. Jama was a popular entertainment, especially in rural China where literacy rates were low. Hello, today we have a very special guest, Zhang He. Hi. What was one of your accomplishments? Well, I felt great after leaving all seven voyages. About how far did the voyages range from? From Southeast Asia to Eastern Africa. What went on when you met your destination? I distributed gifts including silk and silver to show my Chinese superiority. What happened after the seventh voyage? China withdrew into isolation in 1433. All right, well, thank you. It was a pleasure to have you. Bye. We will now talk about Japan returning to isolation. In the 1300s, the unity in Japan broke down. The shoguns in the south and north fought each other for power. The Tameo, who were warrior chieftains, became lords in the new Japanese feudalism. A haiku is a 5x7x5 five by by five syllable three line poem. Okay. So here's my personal interview with Oda Nabunaga. What did you do to try to get rid of them? My 3,000 soldiers armed with muskets, crushed in enemy force of cavalry. This was the first time for firearms had been used effectively in battle in Japan. Were you successful in attempting to unify Japan? Sadly, no. In 1582, when my own general turned out on me, I committed seppuku. What is that? The ritual suicide of a samurai. Okay. Hey. One. Two. Three. What is that sound? May I have a word? Certainly. I am Toy Tommy Hideyoshi. How do you feel about this best general? I am honored. What were some of the tasks you have done as a general? Well, first off, I set out to destroy the Jumeo, which remained task. What exactly did you do in 1950? I combined brutal forces with shrewd political alliances, which led me to control most of Japan. What did you do in 1952? I invaded Korea and began a long campaign against the Koreans and their main Chinese allies. All right, thank you. I'll let you go back to your meditating. Bye. Hello, we are actors at the Kabuki Theater. Townspeople attend this theater to watch actors, like us, perform modern life skits of people in Tokugawa, Japan, using elaborate costumes, music, dance, mime, mask-like makeup, and exaggerated postures and gestures. Kabuki is a traditional form of Japanese theater. Kabuki was created by a woman, but yet all the roles, both male and female, are performed by males. The Japanese people are thrilled to come to this theater for entertainment, and we love performing these skits for them. It is the best experience of our lives. Thank you for that great information, and now we're going to take you live to see the real thing. <laughs> school students, iPods being too loud. Thank you and good night.